This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 21. Coming up on Space Time. New studies suggest the Moon has loads of water. A look at how gravity affects time. And NASA's long-lived Mars rover, Opportunity, keeps finding new surprises. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new analysis of data based on two lunar missions has found evidence that the Moon's water is widely distributed across the surface and not confined to any particular region or type of terrain. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, indicates that lunar water appears to be plentiful, though not necessarily easily accessible. The study could help researchers understand the origin of the Moon's water and how easy it is to use as a resource. If the Moon has enough water and it's reasonably convenient to access, future explorers might be able to use it as drinking water or to convert into hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel or simply oxygen for breathing. The study's lead author, Joshua Banfield, from the Space Science Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says regardless of what time of day or what latitude they look at, the signal indicating water always seems to be present. In fact, the presence of water doesn't appear to depend on the composition of the surface. The results contradict some earlier studies, which had suggested that more water was detected at the Moon's polar latitudes and that the strength of the water signal waxes and wanes according to the time of the lunar day. Because it's tidally locked with the same side always facing the Earth, a day on the Moon lasts 29.5 Earth days, the same time it takes the Moon to complete one orbit around the Earth. Based on the new findings, the authors suggest that water molecules can sort of hop across the lunar surface until they enter cold traps. These cold traps are located in the dark reaches of craters near the North and South Poles. Now, in planetary science, a cold trap is a region that's so cold, water vapour or other volatiles which come into contact with the surface will remain stable, possibly for billions of years. The debates continue because of the subtleties of how the detection has been achieved so far. The main evidence has come from remote sensing instruments which have measured the strength of sunlight reflecting off the lunar surface. You see, when water's present, instruments like these pick up a spectral fingerprint at wavelengths near 3 micrometers, which lies beyond the visible and in the realm of infrared radiation. The thing is, the surface of the Moon can also get hot enough to literally glow, emitting its own light in the infrared region of the spectrum. The challenge, therefore, is to disentangle this mixture of reflected and emitted light. To tease the two apart, researchers need to have very accurate temperature information. Banfield and colleagues came up with a new way to incorporate temperature information, creating a detailed model for measurements made by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The authors applied this temperature model to data gathered earlier by the visible and infrared spectrometer which NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California provided to India's Chandrayaan-1 lunar orbiter. The new findings of widespread and relatively immobile water suggest that it may be present primarily as hydroxyls, a more reactive relative of water composed of just a single oxygen and hydrogen atom, as opposed to normal water, which is H2O. The thing is, hydroxyl molecules don't stay on their own for long, instead preferring to attach themselves to other chemicals. So the hydroxyls would therefore need to be extracted from other minerals in order to be used. The research also suggests that any water which is present on the Moon probably isn't loosely attached to the surface. By putting limits on how mobile the water or hydroxyls on the surface are, scientists can help constrain how much water would reach the cold traps near the polar regions. Sorting out what happens to water on the Moon could also help researchers better understand the sources of water in its long-term storage on other rocky bodies throughout the solar system. The authors are still working out what the findings are telling them about the source of the Moon's water. The results point towards hydroxyls and or water being simply created by the solar wind hitting the lunar surface. Though the team didn't rule out that the molecules could come from the moon itself, slowly released from deep inside minerals where it's been locked up since the moon was formed. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
Professor Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity has passed yet another test, with scientists building the world's first portable strontium laser lattice optical atomic clock and using it to measure time dilation in a gravitational field. Among relativity's many predictions is that the passage of time changes in relation to a gravitational field. Time moves more slowly the closer you are to a massive object. So, technically, when you're standing up, your feet are aging ever so slightly slower than your head. Scientists using atomic clocks on the ground and in fast-moving jetliners have already proven another of Dr. Einstein's relativity predictions, namely that time passes more slowly the faster one travels towards the speed of light. Relativity theory also tells us that travelling close to the speed of light also increases mass. That's why particles are accelerated to 99.9999% the speed of light in particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So it's logical that time should slow down near massive objects due to the relativistic geodesy field. We already know that gravity affects mass, which is why things never fall up, and that mass bends light, giving astronomers gravitational lensing. So more accurate tests on gravity's effects on time are the logical next step. The effect, known as gravitational redshift, has been tested by scientists previously. But the new tests reported in the journal Nature Physics are the most precise and over a wider range than before. Strontium atom laser lattice optical atomic clocks can measure tiny oscillations in strontium atoms trapped by a lattice of lasers to within one second accuracy over 15 billion years. That's longer than the age of the universe. The portable version, mounted in a special temperature stabilised and vibration dampened trailer, isn't quite that accurate but it's still good enough to measure gravitational redshift at different locations and altitudes. Scientists first took the measurements at a laboratory in France and then 90 kilometres away in Italy, where there was a thousand metres difference in altitude. They used optical fibre links and frequency combs to accurately compare the data. The measurements were also compared to readings from a cryogenic cesium fountain atomic clock and a ytterbium optical lattice atomic clock. While scientists still have some bugs to iron out of the system, the measurements generally were consistent. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Now, Fred, we're going to talk about time and atomic clocks and measurement, but uh, people like me, the average person, uh, think about time in terms of our day-to-day -day lives. We, we live our lives in seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. And that's our concept of time. But uh, scientists see time in a very different way and, and the universe uh, has different elements of time. Uh, and we've got this really fascinating story about the use of uh, atomic clocks to measure things. Now, atomic clocks you would normally associate with time. So what are they doing here? You're right. You're quite right. To we... Uh, humans, uh, the passage of time is a fairly constant thing. But since the early part of the 20th century, when Einstein really revolutionized our thinking on time and space, we've known that time actually varies depending on what state you're in. And in particular, it depends on your state of motion, which is something that comes out of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Two people moving at different speeds will actually experience time in different ways. Really only becomes important when you're moving at nearly the speed of light, which you and I never do. No. Uh, so <laughs> so it, it's something that's fairly esoteric, but of course it comes very much into importance in things like the Large Hadron Collider, where you're whizzing particles around at almost the speed of light. But the other way in which time is affected, and this came from Einstein's general theory of relativity in 1915, that is what's called the gravitational time dilation. So it means if you put a clock, you know, somebody watching it probably, in a gravitational field, for example, near the surface of the Earth, it will run slightly slightly more slowly than if it is out in deep space. And it's not the fault of the clock. There's nothing wrong with the clock. It's simply that time itself slows down. The twin paradox. And yeah, that's you've got right. two four-year-old twins. You send one of them into space for four years at uh, near the speed of light. He comes back eight years old and the other one's 104. That's the yes, twin exactly. paradox. And it's, That is indeed. It's that quite extraordinary. About, that comes about because of the special theory of relativity, the fact that mm. uh, things that are moving relative to one another have experienced time differently. But the gravitation one is really interesting because what it means is that for us folk here on earth time is actually running slightly more slowly than if we were just in deep space and kind of hanging around so is it possible to measure that 
because the difference is minuscule. It gets really significant when you're near something with huge gravitational potential like a black hole, but we aren't in a black hole, we're in a fairly normal-sized rocky planet with modest gravity. Is it possible to measure that gravitational time difference? And the answer is yes. We've had for some time, probably about the last five years or so, incredibly accurate atomic clocks. The, the current versions are called strontium lattice clocks, and they exist in some of the laboratories in the world. They're accurate to something like one second in 30 billion years. It wow. is just extraordinary stuff. That's amazing. Like, which is kind of twice the age of the universe. No excuses for being late for work. No. Well, no, that's right. So what has happened is that physicists, actually based in Germany, I think principally, have built a portable version of this strontium lattice clock that can be moved around. And what they've done is they've taken it up a mountain and they've compared the time that it records with the time on a similar clock, which is actually in a, a lab in Torino in Italy. And what they're trying to do is show that because the Torino clock is about a thousand meters below the level of the mountain clock, there should be a difference in time. And in fact, that difference, the expected difference, is such that if you had, let me find the figure here because it's quite staggering. Mm. If you have two clocks differing in height above sea level by a thousand meters, you would expect one of them, the higher one, to run at a rate that in 10 years the difference between them would be 31 millionths of a second. <laughs> So 31 millionths of a second is, is what you're measuring over 10 years. Yeah. Over a year, it would be three millionths of a second. But it proves but some, that the gravitational effect on time is real. That's right, if you can measure it. Mm. And I was going to say that such is the accuracy of these strontium lattice clocks. That they have done. Yes, they've done it. They've measured that difference. They haven't got it quite as accurately as the 31 millionths of a second per decade would suggest, but they can detect the difference between them in the rate of ticking of the atomic clocks. It's spectacular. Spectacular stuff. It is. Really quite remarkable. And this has been demonstrated in science fiction, and I'm going to refer to the movie Interstellar. Uh, well, that was a story about trying to find a way of getting humans to another planet because our planet was dying. Uh, and they were investigating one planet which was close to a black hole. And because of the gravitational effect of the black hole, this planet's time equated to uh, every hour on the planet meant seven years passed on Earth. Yes. Now, that's a pretty extreme example of it, but they were using gravitational effect of time to demonstrate yeah. the, the problem. And unfortunately, these people were stuck on the planet for three hours, four hours, and 28 years passed by on Earth. It's, um, yeah, it looked that... that is a, a really interesting example of, uh, of what we're talking about. I much prefer the 31 millionth of a second per decade issue. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can handle right. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we can handle that. That's yeah. right. At, at least no, you're not going to get questions about where the hell have you been. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it is interesting stuff, though, in, in terms of demonstrating the validity of uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity once again. It's fantastic proof that he was right on the money with his time dilation, gravitational time dilation. Yeah, and I suppose it also draws attention to just how incredibly intelligent he was because he didn't have the tools that we've got no. today. He, he, he would have had to do a lot of thinking, a lot of hard thinking, to come up with some of these concepts. So he was, a, he was an extraordinary man. Indeed he was. Mm. Indeed he was. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Well, it seems NASA's Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity keeps finding new surprises about the red planet, the most recent with observations of what look like rock stripes. The ground texture seen in recent images from the rover resembles a smudged version of very distinctive stone stripes seen on some mountain slopes on Earth which are caused by repeated cycles of freezing and thawing of wet soil. But scientists stress this could also be due to wind or other processes. The Opportunity rover landed on Mars in January 2004 on what was designed to be a 90-day mission. It's now reaching its 5,000th day on the surface of the Red Planet. 
Oppie, as it's become known to mission managers, is investigating a channel called Perseverance Valley, which descends the inboard slope of the western rim of Endeavour Crater. Opportunity Rover Deputy Principal Investigator Ray Ardvidson from Washington University in St Louis says Perseverance Valley is mysterious and exciting and quite unlike any place any Mars rover has seen before. Scientists aren't sure how it formed and these stone-striped surfaces are just another part of the puzzle. On some slopes within the valley, the soil and gravel particles appear to become organised into narrow rows or corrugations parallel to the slope and alternating between rows with more gravel and rows with less. The origin of the whole valley is uncertain about whether this texture results from processes of relatively modern Mars or a much older planet. Other lines of evidence have convinced Mars experts that on a scale of hundreds of thousands of years, the red planet goes through cycles when the tilt or obliquity of its axis increases by so much that some of the water now frozen at the poles vaporises into the atmosphere and then becomes snow or frost accumulating nearer the equator. One possible explanation for these stripes is that they're relics of a time of greater obliquity, when snowpacks on the crater rim seasonally melted enough to moisten the soil and then freeze-thaw cycles organise the small rocks into stripes. The gravitational downhill movement may then be diffusing them so they don't look as crisp as what they probably did when they were fresh. That's because the alignments seen in images of Perseverance Valley aren't anywhere near as distinctive as stone stripes seen on Earth at places like near the summit of Hawaii's Mauna Kea, where the soil freezes every night but is often dry. Scientists have documented how these form when temperatures and ground conditions are right. It seems soils with a mix of silt, sand and gravel expand more when the finer grain material is more prevalent and retains more water. Freezing expands the soil, pushing larger particles up. If they move to the side as well as down the general slope due to gravity or wind, they tend to move away from the finer grain concentrations and stretch out down slope. And when larger particles become more concentrated, the ground expands less. The process then repeats hundreds of thousands of times, and the pattern self-organises into alternating stripes. Perseverance Valley holds rocks carved by sand blowing uphill from the crater floor and wind might also be a key to sorting larger particles into rows parallel to the slope. However, debris from relatively fresh impact craters is scattered all over the surface of this area, further complicating assessment of the effects of wind. NASA's twin Mars exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, were launched on separate Boeing Delta II rockets from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida in 2003. Spirit, launched on June the 10th, landed in Gusev Crater near the Martian equator on January the 4th, 2004. It continued exploring the Red Planet for some 23 times longer than its scheduled 90-day mission, covering some 7.73 kilometres, far beyond its planned 600-metre journey. On May 1st, 2009, Spirit became bogged in soft, sandy soil, unable to escape but it continued operating as a stationary science platform until, that is, dust covered its solar panels, preventing its batteries from recharging. Spirit's last communications with Earth was on March the 22nd, 2010. Spirit's identical twin rover, Opportunity, blasted into space three weeks after Spirit on July the 7th, 2003, touching down on the Meridiani Planum on the opposite side of Mars to Spirit on January 25th, 2004. So far, it's exceeded its initial 90-day mission by almost 14 years, covering some 46 kilometres with no signs yet of slowing down. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. And a new study by scientists at Sydney's Westmead Hospital has found that vitamin D may help prevent heart failure following a heart attack. The findings, reported in the journal Heart, Lung and Circulation, indicate vitamin D may help protect heart tissue and prevent heart failure after a heart attack, potentially offering a low-cost addition to existing treatments for heart failure. Researchers found that 125D, a form of vitamin D, interacts with hormones on cells that form scar tissue following a heart attack. These cells, called cardiac colony forming unit fibroblasts, prevents excessive scarring and thickening of heart tissue after a heart attack. Heart attacks occur when blood supply to the heart is blocked, leading to tissue damage. 
This triggers an inflammatory response where the fibroblasts replace the damaged tissue with collagen-based scar tissue. The problem is the scarring can reduce the heart's ability to pump blood efficiently, potentially leading to heart failure. A new study by NOAA, America's National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has confirmed that climate change being caused by the use of fossil fuels has now triggered the fastest decline in Arctic sea ice in the last 1,500 years. The new findings show that the days when the Arctic Ocean would reliably freeze over every year are now over. In fact, the Arctic is going through the most unprecedented transition in human history, warming at twice the rate of the rest of the planet according to both satellite readings and ice core samples. Despite the claims of the fossil fuel industry and climate change deniers, the latest observations show that Arctic sea ice for the month of January has reached a new record low. And right now, the planet has the least amount of sea ice since satellite record-keeping began in the 1970s. And the thing is, many animals, including polar bears, depend on the ice to survive. Polar bears hunt seals on frozen ice and have few food resources on land. Because of this, starving polar bears are becoming an increasingly common and tragic sight. And as the highly reflective sea surface ice melts, the darker ocean is exposed, which traps more heat, causing even more melting. A feedback loop is underway. Now, when sea ice melts, it doesn't change sea levels. But the thing is, that extra heat's also melting ice on land, and that's causing sea levels to rise. The problem made even worse by water temperatures increasing, causing the water to physically expand, and again causing a rise in sea level. A new study claims teens who get support from and are involved with their schools, communities and families, and have friends who are also community-minded, are more than twice as likely to always use condoms during sex. The findings, reported in the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Public Health, are based on a survey of 1,700 high school students. The students were all in the same year, form or grade, and aged about 16. The study also found that kids who have goals and aspirations for their life were also more likely to use prophylactic protection during coitus. And while we're on the subject of teenagers, a new study claims the key to lifting teenage moods could be sitting in the kitchen pantry. Scientists at Murdoch University have found that the spice saffron works as a natural treatment for mild depressive and anxiety symptoms in adolescents. The findings are reported in the journal Effective Disorders. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.